This week, we'll talk about the history of the tarot, where it came from, who used it, and what it was used for. We'll have an article from Jamie Paul Lamb about the tarot as well, giving his high-level overview on the tarot's significance. And we'll also get a great look at the tarot from a quasi-Masonic point of view. And if that's not cool enough, we're going to draw a card and see what that card could mean for us. We've also got illustrious Brother Harrison stopping by for an all-new Masonic Minute. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Welcome back to the show. This is episode number 520. As always, I want to thank the producers, fellows, contributors, and legacy partners of the WCY podcast. We've been making the show since July of 2011. That's over 10 years of the podcast. We've got 520 episodes available for you all the time, on demand, Masonic education for anyone who is interested in the royal art. If you'd like to find out how you can assist making Masonic education available to everybody, head on over to WCYpodcast.com and check out how you can support us either through Patreon or through PayPal. We've also got a number of things you can purchase on our shop. All the details are there, and thank you in advance for checking that out. On the presentation schedule, I want to give a huge shout out to Star on the East Lodge, as well as Brother David from the Seperade lecture series. Uh, I'll be wrapping up the third part of the Quantum Entanglement and Apotheosis on that Quantum Lecture Series Part 3 on November 17th. That'll be at 11 a.m. And then the very next day, uh, on 11.18, I'll be doing that same lecture for Acacia Lodge via Zoom. Uh, so both the Acacia Lodge virtual and the uh, Cyberaude lecture will be Zoom-based. I know the Quantum Entanglement lecture, the first one for Saperati, will be live on Facebook. And if you have questions about that, you can go to wcypodcast.com, click on Presentation Schedule, and there'll be a link back to Saperati. And of course, I am going to be speaking on the 27th of December at Terry Hout Lodge, number 19. And it's going to be a great event. They're going to be doing a Feast of St. John's event. And I'll be doing the Colonial Freemasonry presentation, which focuses on a little bit of Americana history and celebrating what we have here that is so special. So, this week I promised that we would get into something a little bit deeper for some of our folks out there. But, if you're not into the topic, that's okay. Stick with us, because we're not going to get all wooey here with the topic. Now, I'm going to talk about tarot in this episode, and I, for one, am a follower of tarot. I study Paul Case's work pretty extensively, a member of Boda and all of these things. However, the concept behind the tarot is very contemplative in nature and is not necessarily used uh, in my practices and most people's practices for anything other than contemplative real practice. Uh, it is not divinatory per se, unless you think that a card might remind you of something and then you personally manifest that through, you know, the law of attraction or perhaps it reminds you to do something or to focus on something. So just keep in mind, it's not cardomancy, it's not uh, divinatory really, it's not conjuring unless it's conjuring your own feelings. So that's the angle we're going to take this week. We'll read a couple of papers about the tarot and give you some preliminary information. And then at the end of the episode, as we talked about in the opener, we'll go ahead and pull a card after we shuffle and see what we get. Then we can contemplate on that a little bit and share our thoughts in the Craftsman Plus Facebook group, which is available to the supporters of the program. Now, this is a foundational episode for what's to come, so we'll reference this episode from time to time when talking about the tarot, and I should also mention that we won't spend this much time talking about tarot in future episodes. We'll simply draw a card. I'll give a little bit of an interpretation, and that'll just be that part of the episode. So, why don't we go ahead and get started? So, the first piece I'd like to read for you actually comes from an excerpt from a series of books published in the early 90s and gives a somewhat concise and historically accurate depiction of the tarot. 
It picks up mid-chapter. Among many believers in the power of symbols to provide guides to the future, the I Ching is rivaled by another popular system, the tarot. It is perhaps not so ancient as the I Ching, but is almost as complex. In using tarot, a would-be diviner consults a deck of 78 elaborately illustrated cards of enduring popularity and tantalizing mystery. Unlike practitioners of numerology in the I Ching, tarot readers do not rely on numbers or images that have been selected for the situation. Instead, meaning is derived from the particular arrangement of the cards. Interpreting the cards is no simple matter. Those wishing to learn the art are advised to spend long periods meditating on the individual cards of the deck and on their multiplicity of interrelationships. According to one authority on the subject, such study helps to build bridge of intuition between the reader's unconscious mind and the symbolism found in the cards. A good deal of ritual is involved as well. When not using their tarot decks, dedicated diviners keep them wrapped in a square or purple-black silk and placed in a covered wooden box. For optimal results, the box should be out of sight and facing eastward, which is thought to be the direction of enlightenment. Moreover, the deck should never be handled by idly curious or the mocking, for it is said that the tarot responds to such people with unpleasant, if not dire, predictions. Now an interlude here into this is that this is a very, very pop culture type discussion in this particular text. It's probably what you might be used to. However, the line, according to authority on the subject, such study helps to build a bridge of intuition between the reader's unconscious mind and the symbolism found in the cards, is probably the most accurate thing they've said thus far. Let's continue. In current practice, little changed from older ways. The reader usually begins by having the inquirer select a card from the deck's so-called Major Arcana, made up of 22 cards bearing strange and ominous images, such as the magician gesturing oddly with his arm, or a skeleton wielding a scythe. The card selected, called the Significator, influences the entire reading. Next, the Inquirer shuffles the remaining cards, often, but not always, including the 56 cards that make up the part of the deck known as the Minor Arcana, and cuts them. After retrieving the deck, the reader lays out a specific number of cards in a traditional pattern for study. One common layout, called a Celtic Cross, has the top card from the deck placed atop the Significator. The next card laid lengthwise across the first, and then four more cards placed above, below, to the right and left of the first group. Together these cards define the inquirer's situation and forces acting upon him or her. Four more cards are then turned over and placed in a column to the right of the central group of cards. These final four contain the divinatory message which the reader delivers after careful consideration of the supposed significance of each card. Stories abound about those whose fates have been foretold by the mysterious cards. One such tale concerns Henry Cuff, the 16th century author, scholar, and secretary to England's Robert Devereux, second Earl of Essex. According to some accounts, when he wanted to learn about his future, he consulted a reader of the tarot, and when told that the cards predicted he would suffer an unnatural death, he demanded details. The reader responded by telling him to draw three cards from the tarot deck, and to place them on the table face down. Then, if Cuff still wanted more information, all he had to do was turn the cards over, one after another. The first card depicted a man, in the custody of guards. The second portrayed a scene of judgment in tribunal. The third bore the images of the gallows and the hangman. Cuff apparently found the last card amusing, for he reportedly laughed out loud. Whether he saw a joke or irony, no one knows. But. On March 13, 1601, Cuff was found guilty of helping the Earl of Essex plot against Queen Elizabeth I. Later that same day, he was taken to the gallows and hanged. Like so many tales of the mysterious and occult, the account of the Cuff's consultation with a tarot reader may well be apocryphal. As a matter of fact, the cards may not have been used for divination until a considerable time after Cuff was put to death. Nevertheless, such stories about the eerie accuracy of the predictions of the tarot cards, particularly in connection with unusual death, have circulated for centuries. No one knows for certain the beginning of the tarot, or for that matter those of standard playing cards, which are also used in cartomancy, or divining the future with cards. Playing cards are believed to have originated in China or Korea sometime in the 10th or 11th century AD, 
perhaps evolving from the first paper money whose designs seemed to be familiar to those on some of the cards. Within a few hundred years, they made their way to Europe. A German monk writing in a Swiss monastery in 1377 referred to the new game that came to us this year, quote unquote, the first known reference to playing cards in the West. Tarot cards do not appear in recorded history until the mid-15th century, when a hand-painted tarot pack was presented to the young Duke of Milan. Although no mention was made of where the cards came from, it is clear they were not considered new at the time. This observation has caused some to speculate that Italy is the true home of the tarot, a conclusion strengthened by the fact that two medieval Italian card decks, Tarocci and Minciati, are strikingly similar to the tarot in their numbered cards as well as in their trumps. In recent times, various researchers have attempted to trace the tarot etymologically, examining various languages for word clues. Some have claimed that the tarot comes from the ancient Hindustani teru for pack of cards, while others have said it comes from the tarot a French word supposedly referring to a design on the back of the cards. It has also been proposed that the tarot got its name from the first place where it was known to have appeared, the northern Italian region near the Taro River. As for the original purpose of the cards, there is evidence that they may have descended from a perfectly mundane medieval instructional card game that used elaborate picture cards for memory training. No one knows, however, and those with an interest in the occult are attracted to some much more exotic possibilities. Some have proposed that the tarot originated with the Gnostics, a heretical Christian sect that flourished in the 2nd century and virtually died out in the 3rd century, but whose ideas survived long afterwards. The Gnostics, who took the name from the Greek word gnosis for knowledge, believed that the material things were a creation of the devil, and that the human soul or godhead was imprisoned in the body and could be liberated only through a process of enlightenment. Taken in sequence, the cards of the tarot's major arcana have been interpreted as a representation of the major principles of Gnosticism, beginning with the Fool card as a symbol of human ignorance, or the divine power within, and ending with a spiritual ascension to the heavens of the world card. Whatever their origins, tarot cards and corporate images that have resonated down through the ages, Christian, Islamic, Norse, and Celtic ideas can be found in them. The Judgment card, for example, suggests the Biblical Apocalypse, while the Tower struck by Lightning card can be seen as reminiscent of the Hammer of Thor, the Norse god of thunder. Indeed, such are the universality of the symbols that practitioners always seem to be able to find in them whatever they want to see. The Tarot remained relatively popular throughout the Renaissance, and then in the 18th century scholars became fascinated with the putative wisdom of the ancient Egyptians. The hieroglyphs had yet to be deciphered, and speculation about their meaning was unrestrained. It was perhaps inevitable that someone would propose links between the tarot and Egypt, thus sprung new interest in the colorful cards. In 1781, Antoine Court de Gabelin, French author and theologian, took note of the odd-looking deck of cards some friends were playing with. Examining the exotic cards of the tarot with increasing fascination, he immediately declared them to be of Egyptian origin. The four suits of the Minor Arcana, de Geblin said, represented the four classes of Egyptian society. The name of the deck he believed to be a combination of two Egyptian words, tar, or roadway, and ro, or king, hence the royal road. Considering the prevailing ideas of the time, the theory seemed to be perfectly plausible. Not long after de Geblin published his work, a Parisian by the name of Elliot, a wig maker turned fortune teller, enlarged upon the Egyptian connection. Using the pseudonym Atelia, his own name spelled backwards, Elliot claimed that the major arcana was the work of seventeen magi in service to Hermes Trismagistus, or Thoth, the Egyptian god of wisdom and magic. Thoth had wished that all his secret knowledge be written down on leaves of gold. The Magi encoded the knowledge into pictures and then assembled them into a complete book whose original name, Aliette claimed, was the Book of Thoth. Although Aliette's method of tarot reading spread rapidly, he was widely accepted. Later occultists would ridicule the French fortune teller for the fanciful notions he espoused concerning the origins of the cards. Others, however, updated the Egyptian theme, theorizing that the cards originated in Egypt during the Crusades when Christian armies made their way eastward from Europe, laying waste to the countryside 
and besieging cities in hopes of wrestling control of the Holy Land from the infidels. Egyptian priests determined to preserve their libraries of occult lore allegedly seized on a desperate stratagem. They translated their secret wisdom into images and the symbols, inscribed them on playing cards, and then gave the deck to a passing gambler who, being accomplished in deceit, would doubtlessly elude the enemy. It is believed that the ancient knowledge survived as a result accessible in future generations to those who were wise enough to decipher the symbolism of the tarot. By the mid-19th century, interest in Egyptians had waned, somewhat, among students of the arcane. But fascination with the Hebrew Kabbalah was growing, and the remarkably adaptable tarot cards were soon applied to yet another system of belief. In 1856, the Frenchman, Eliphas Levi, produced a work in which he traced each of the tarot's four suits to one of the four letters of YHWH, or Yahweh, or yod heh vav -Heh, the unutterable name for God in the Old Testament. Combining this system with a sprinkling of numerology, he derived additional significance from the fact that there were 22 cards in the tarot's major arcana. Just as there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. The letter Aleph, for example, was the first in the alphabet and also stood for number one. As Levi wrote, Aleph was associated with being mind, man, god, and the unity mother of numbers. He claimed that all of these were symbolized in the card of the juggler whose posture resembled the Aleph's shape. Similarly, he implied that, just as the Kabbalah comprised secret knowledge of the whole world, tarot was a synthesis of everything humankind could ever hope to learn. Despite a complete lack of confirming evidence, no factual connection between Kabbalah and the tarot has ever been established. Eliphas Levi's interpretations gained adherence among occultists throughout Europe. For almost 20 years after he passed away in 1875, his home city of Paris remained a major center of occult activity, frequented by the likes of poets, magician, and drug user Stanislas de Guaita, and his friend Gerard Encosse, who was better known as Pappas. The two men were heavily influenced by Levi, especially Pappas, who described the tarot as quote-unquote the book of primitive revelation of ancient civilizations, the most ancient book in the world and suggested that it quote-unquote condenses in very few simple laws the whole of the acquired knowledge. Levi's influence spread to England as well. In London in 1888, S.L. McGregor Mathers founded an occult society called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, whose numerous members included the poet W.B. Yeats, author Bram Stoker, who would achieve immortality of a sort with his best-selling gothic novel, Dracula. The Golden Dawn expanded Levi's theories into a comprehensive system that studied and taught the tarot as an integral part of several other occult practices, such as ritual magic, alchemy, and numerology. Mathers presided over the society until its members expelled him in 1900 for his autocratic leadership. When he made his exit, he called down curses upon them. At least one member of the Golden Dawn, a historian of the occult named Arthur Edward Waite, was more of a realist than his colleagues, dismissing most ruminations on the tarot's mysterious origins as sheer fantasy. The chief point regarding the history of the tarot cards, he wrote, is that such history does not exist. But, while dismissing the cards' as use in divining as fortune-telling as rubbish, he did believe that they might well be the carriers of some ancient lore. He wrote a book connecting the four symbols of the Holy Grail legend, cup, lance, dish, and sword, to the tarot's four suits. He also designed one of the more famous tarot packs, by far the most controversial member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was the impressible Aleister Crowley, a practitioner of demonology as well as various kinds of ritual magic. An imposing figure who was frequently photographed wearing exotic headdresses, Crowley was once dubbed the English press the wickedest man in the world. He relished the title, among his many other curious beliefs. Crowley was convinced that he was the reincarnation of Elephas Levi. The Magic of the Tarot with a complex, controversial, and abstruse tarot, certainties are elusive. Nevertheless, it is generally agreed among believers that the cards have a dual significance. They are at once mystical and divinatory. Their supposed occult nature rests primarily with the 22 cards of the Major Arcana or Trump's Major. These are regarded widely as allegories for the soul's journey from ignorance to enlightenment or the human sojourn through life, or as a mystical key to the secrets of the universe and the place of humans therein. For thousands who believe in its power, the tarot also evaluates the past, elucidates the present, and predicts the future. 
both the Major Arcana and the 56-card Minor Arcana, which is divided into suits of wands, cups, swords, and pentacles, are used in divinatory readings. Some say the cards tap the psychic awareness of the reader, the inquirer, or both. Others contend the cards carry their own meanings, intrinsic and absolute. But what meanings? Hundreds of different tarots are used today, and interpretations of the cards may vary from deck to deck and from reader to reader. Each reader, and each inquirer, for that matter, brings his or her own imprint to the cards. Moreover, perceived meanings can be altered by the card's positions relative to each other, and by whether or not a card falls upright or inverted. So this comes from an excerpt of a book called Visions and Prophecies, Mysteries of the Unknown. And I hope you enjoyed that short excerpt that gave a brief but somewhat skewed history of the tarot. It places a lot of weight on the divinatory or cartomancy of the tarot. And um, simply put, that might have been the in vogue thing of the day. However, that is not generally how it is used today. They can be, in a sense, predicting the future if you believe that if I tell you the meaning of a card and then you think, well, this is how it might mean that thing might work out for me, now you're projecting yourself and then thinking about your own personal situations and now I've got you thinking about the future and your own situations and you're being contemplative and now you can use your intuition and when that situation happens, maybe you think back to what we talked about and now you have a new course of action that you're ready to use because you actually got to contemplate something that was based in your subconscious mind before the event came to your conscious mind, like right there in the moment. So you see how this can kind of sound confusing, but it really isn't. It's very simple. It's just questions and answers, and it's always going to be correct because the meaning is always personal for you. Usually a bad tarot reading is when somebody does a poor job of attempting to help somebody relate to their own life. Which is why it is best when there's at least some kind of a relationship between the people getting the readings, I feel. I generally do not read for people who I don't know terribly well. We might have an exploratory session at least once before we ever do a reading, but that's how I work. So anyway, before we go any deeper, I'd like to get into this week's Masonic Minute with illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison. You have made your journey to the east. Planning for this milestone consumed you. It saturated your life. Thoughts of budgets and programs bloated your brain until there was room for nothing else. And, oh yes, there was that big part you had to memorize. Then you got there. You brought those programs to life. You managed the budget, you were gut-punched by the unexpected, you punched back, you won. Now your year is coming to an end. Where, you wonder, did the time go? It all went by so quickly. Suddenly you realize you are traveling near light speed toward the event horizon, the point of no return of the great black hole of Freemasonry, life after being master of your lodge. Maybe it doesn't hit you right away. Oh, those first few weeks after your term is over, that sweet era when the responsibility void hits, when the burdens of leadership rest on someone else's shoulders when you get to go to meetings, plan nothing, do nothing, and wear that sporty new past master's apron is a nirvana reserved for a precious few. The newly minted junior past master. But it's an illusion. You eventually realize you've been sucked into the great void. Oblivion awaits. You can't sit in the north heckling the ritual performance forever. You can only take so much listening to debates about the menu at the next dinner, reading of the minutes, and grousing about the outrageous bill to fix the air conditioner. You realize they can do all of this without you. Weeks ago, you were the most important guy in the lodge. 
now you are, by your standard, irrelevant. You're not even the top dog of all the past masters. You're at the bottom of the barrel. And like anything that reaches singularity in a black hole, you disappear. Experience shows us it happens to many, possibly the majority, of past masters. They gradually stop coming to meetings, fade away, and leave us wondering whatever happened to them. As you try to fight this trend, instead of whence came you, a new question pops up. Whence go you? Or more simply, now what? The fact is, most of us don't want to sit around doing nothing. We need relevance, something to do, a goal, a project, a responsibility. Part of your planning as you approach the East should be to figure out what you will do when it's all over. Your lodge has many needs you can fill. Maybe it needs a new lodge education officer, an appointed office filled, a mentor for new initiates, a lodge historian, someone to take the helm of a civic project, or, God forbid, a new secretary. There are also appendant bodies to consider. The York and Scottish Rites especially offer more opportunities for Masonic education, fellowship, or community service. Grand Lodge committees always need staffing. You might even put together an article for the Midnight Freemasons or one of your state or local Masonic publications. Whatever you do, vow to stay active. And the activities you choose should include those that keep you coming back to the foundation of our fraternity, your lodge. For the Whence Came You podcast, this is Steve Harrison with the Masonic Minute. Well, Steve Harrison does it again. I have to say, I didn't once ever really think about what I was going to do when I left the East because I already knew I had been planning for an entire year that, as Steve put it, God forbid, I became Lodge Secretary, which I did. And uh, I did that for three years for them. And uh, then I moved to a different Lodge after we chartered and became its secretary. And I'm going on the secretary of Space Novum for our third year also. So I have been a lodge secretary for about six years. And I think as we all go through the East, it becomes more difficult for those of us who aren't going to do something like be a lodge secretary, because maybe some other things don't have as much weight to put on our shoulders. And for some of us, we need projects constantly. Otherwise, we get frustrated or any number of things. But as Steve put it, I think there's a number of projects that we could get involved in as long as our lodges are ready to take on something new and take on a dedication to giving those past masters a bit of leeway and trust, as it were, to take on something that will make their lodge even better. Many thanks to illustrious Brother Harrison for his work. If you like this, please head on over to WZYPodcast.com, click on the bookstore, check out all of his books, and of course, check out the links to the Missouri Lodge of Research, which is M-O-L-O-R dot O-R-G, and also check out the WZY Podcast YouTube channel so that you can subscribe to these videos that he actually produces for the show. So we're hearing the audio, but there is a video for this and you can check it out when those drop. Many thanks, illustrious Brother Harrison. You're the man, and we thank you for your constant dedication to bringing more light to our brothers globally. All right, let's get a little bit back into tarot. Uh, in an effort to get more contemplative, I am all the time thinking about what we can do to get there. And something that struck me just recently is this idea of uh, something that I do in my daily routine is a daily tarot card draw. And I look at the card and I think about what it could mean for me in my present day and situation. This is a reflective exercise, really psychological, not 
cartomancy, not divinatory by any means, but allows you to think about things and access perhaps your intuition, your own intuition. So this week, the next educational article I wanted to present for you actually comes from the Tria Prima website. And I think you all know Brother Jamie Paul Lamb, who has written extensively on uh, quite a number of topics and subjects. And I know one of his passions is, of course, uh, tarot as well as astrology. But let's see what he has to say in his article, What Do Tarot Cards Have to Do with Freemasonry?, which was published in March of 2020. As Freemasons, we periodically encounter references to tarot cards and tarot imagery in the vicinity of Masonic subjects. The frequency of the exposure to tarot imagery is much greater among those who are involved in more esoteric avenues of Masonic research. This may cause the Mason to wonder why this is the case. It is the purpose of this article to elucidate what connections there may be between this strange deck of cards and our noble craft. We will consider from whence these cards came and how Freemasons helped shape their evolution at nearly every crucial juncture in their development. While playing cards themselves are believed to have been introduced in Europe sometime in the early 14th century, it is generally believed that the tarot deck was invented sometime between 1411 and 1425 by adding the 22 trump cards to the standard playing card deck. At that time, playing cards had 56, not 52 cards due to there being an additional court card. The addition of the trumps meant that a tarot deck had 78 cards total, 40 pips, 16 court cards, and 22 trumps. These additional cards, which are pictorial in design, have come to be known as the Major Arcana, a designation bestowed upon them by Freemason Arthur Edward Waite, whom we shall discuss shortly. The word trump is an anglicization of the Italian word trionfi, meaning a victory or celebratory procession, and shares this etymological root with the word triumph. While tarot had already been in use for divination and fortune-telling for some time, the beginnings of tarot esotericism can be traced to the publication of Le Monde Primitif in 1781 by Swiss Freemason Antoine de Gebelin, initiated 1771 at Lodge Les Amis Réunis, or Rouni. In his book, de Gebelin interprets the symbolism of the Marseille tarot, ultimately concluding that the origins of the mysterious deck point back to ancient mystery traditions such as those of Isis and Osiris and other survivals of arcane religious symbolism. De Gebelin was also the first to propose that the tarot was composed as a distillation of the collected wisdom contained at the Library of Alexandria, which was destroyed by fire in 48 BCE and that deck thereby contained cryptic arcana from the ancient world. This arcana, however, was encoded in symbolism meant only to be deciphered by those of certain attainment in the language of symbols. This challenge seems to have attracted many Freemasons to the task. The attribution of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet to the 22 trump cards in the major arcana is believed to have been first made by Eliphas Levi, a Hebrew transliteration of his given name, Alphonse Louis Constant initiated 1861 at Lodge Rose du Parfait Silence, an eminent occultist, Rosicrucian, and Freemason. Levi's magnum opus, Dogma and Ritual of High Magic, 1854 and 56, is divided into 22 chapters, each corresponding to a letter of the Hebrew alphabet and to the cards of the tarot's major arcana. Other correspondences related to Kabbalah, alchemy, astrology, hermeticism, and of course, ceremonial magic are made throughout the work and attributed to their corresponding tarot card and Hebrew letter. The book was especially influential to Albert Pike, who cribbed large, uncredited passages of Levi's work for inclusion in his Morals and Dogma in the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, 1871. Levi's chief translator and commentator, later in the 19th century and into the 20th, was Arthur Edward Waite, a mason whose shadow continues to loom long over the world of the tarot. Freemason and Masonic Rosicrucian Arthur Edward Waite, initiated 1901 at Runnymede Lodge No. 2430, was also a member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, a Victorian magical society founded in 1887 which had a focus on Hermetic Kabbalah whose curriculum and rituals were based on cipher manuscripts, which had been procured from the property of Freemason Kenneth Mackenzie after his death. To his research and experience in the order, Waite undertook the revision of the tarot in accordance with the Hermetic and Kabbalistic correspondences, enlisting fellow Golden Dawn member artist Pamela Coleman Smith, who rendered the original images, Waite irretrievably altered the landscape of the tarot, and to this day, Rider Waite Tarot Deck, 
as it has come to be known, is the most recognizable deck in the world. There are also several allusions made in the imagery that, while they may escape the notice of the profane, most Masons would be able to discern. Later in the 20th century, Freemasons such as Paul Foster Case, initiated in 1926 at Fairport Lodge, number 476, and Manley P. Hall, initiated 1954 at Jewel Lodge, number 374, among others have contributed to the evolution of this strange pack of cards. A pack of cards which continue to fascinate both the initiated and the profane, but seem to have particularly strong resonance with Freemasons. Now, with Jamie's work here, he's given you kind of a high-level overview of where these cards may have come from. Now, of course, they, they do relate to a game that was once played called Tarochi, kind of an amalgamation of Uno and maybe poker. And if we're being historically accurate and uh, not giving way to our conspiratorial nature of wanting more, these cards then become something of value to the occultist, not the other way around. Do I believe they came from the Archive of Alexandria? I do not. Am I part of an organization whose foundation is the work with the tarot? And to be an expert with them, I am. So where do I stand in some of this? Well, that doesn't matter. Because what I want to present for all of you is the thing that does matter, which is what you're feeling when we pull a card and talk about what it means in your own life. Now, before we pull that card, I'd also like to read a short piece from the Masonic Philosophical Society. Of both of these articles, by the way, I will have in the show notes for you to dive in to read. But this one is called Symbolism, Freemasonry and the Tarot by Elaine Polonius Fallon, August 5th, 2019, so published just about a year before. She says, Is a picture worth a thousand words? In our modern society, most are acquainted with tarot cards as a form of divination or fortune-telling. However, there is a deeper, more esoteric meaning attached to the tarot. A legend exists related to the tarot which tells of a group of adepts traveling through an enchanted forest. Along the way, these individuals lost their voices and were only able to communicate with each other by displaying tarot cards to one another. Through the exercise of relation via symbols, the adepts were able to navigate out of the forest and into the light. What is the tarot? And what relationship does tarot have with Freemasonry? The Tarot System On a surface level, the tarot is a deck of 78 cards, with its own distinct image and meaning. While many have used the cards as a divination tool, tarot cards can also represent a mysterious oracle of hidden knowledge. The tarot cards are divided into two separate groups, the Major Arcana and the Minor Arcana. The Minor Arcana consists of 56 cards divided into four suits, wands, cups, swords, and pentacles, and four court cards, page, knight, king, and queen. The meaning of the arcana represents what is necessary to know, to discover, to anticipate, so as to be fruitful and creative in one's possible endeavors. Arcana is derived from the Latin words arca meaning chest and arcer meaning to shut or to close. Thus, arcanum symbolically represents a tightly closed treasure chest, which holds a secret meaning. Nobel Prize winner Herbert A. Simon provides this illuminating sentiment related to the tarot. Quote, A symbol is simply the pattern made of any substance whatsoever that is used to denote or point to some other symbol or object or relation between objects. The thing it points to is called its meaning. By reading tarot cards symbolically, each person is able to divine their own meaning and truth. Historical Origins of the Tarot Mystery shrouds the historical origination of the tarot. The French scholar Court de Gebelin wrote that the tarot was the one book of the ancient Egyptians that escaped the burning of the great library of Alexandria. This book was said to contain the quote-unquote purest knowledge of profound matters possessed by the wise men of Egypt. After the library was destroyed, a group of sages met in Fez, Morocco, and decided to preserve the secrets of this ancient text into pictorial form on the cards of the tarot. There is general consensus that the pictures on the cards represented the visual retelling of the secrets of ancient mysteries with different accounts to the wisdom being Egyptian, Zoroastrianism, or Gnostic in tradition. The symbols depicted on the cards provide a manner to keep the secrets safe except for those prepared to receive them. The cards were brought to Europe, purportedly as a result of the Crusades, but were suppressed during the Inquisition of the Catholic Church during the Middle Ages. Tarot and Kabbalah Many esoteric scholars have sought to understand the tarot through the Kabbalah, the mystic teachings of Judaism. 
Kabbalah has been translated to mean receiving from God, the Eternal One. Referred to as the One, the deity is actually twofold in nature, including the male aspect, Adonai, and the female aspect, the Holy Shekinah. The Kabbalistic Tree of Life displayed above is particularly useful in understanding and interpreting the Tarot. The Tree of Life consists of ten spheres, referred to as Sephiro, which are connected by 22 different paths, expressing different interactions between the Sephiro, Kingdom, Foundation, Victory, Splendor, Beauty, Mercy, Severity, Wisdom, Understanding, and Crown. Each path corresponds to a letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which contains 22 letters. Similarly, the tarot deck contains the 10 numbered cards in each minor arcana suit and 22 cards in the major arcana, Freemasonry, and the tarot. What is the relationship between the tarot and Freemasonry? To begin, there is the existence of a Masonic-themed tarot cards. The square encompasses tarot card deck, which is displayed above. Deeper connections exist as well, including the symbolic journey of the initiate into Freemasonry. The tarot has been described as symbolizing the path of initiation of or a journey toward reintegration with one's true self. Know thyself is the motto of the craft. And the 22 cards of the tarot's major arcana provide useful tools for reflection for those interested in doing the work. The cards reveal stages of an archetypal journey of man, with each card representing a stage to be encountered by each individual on their life path. Like the tarot, Freemasonry's origins are difficult to trace and veiled in mystery, and both systems have evolved through history, yet their essential substance remains unchanged. The Masonic scholar A. E. Waite posits that the tarot and Freemasonry are both connected to the legend of the Holy Grail. In his book, The Hidden Church of the Holy Graal, Waite presents his conclusive belief that the tarot is the canonical hallows of the Graal legend, linking the character, Percival, the fool, in the tarot deck to the Mason in search of light. Alternatively, the Masonic writer, Manly P. Hall, argued that the major arcana represent the 22 chapters of the Book of Revelation, a spiritual road map to achieve oneness with God. It has been said that the individuals come to Masonry to remember what has been forgotten, that all knowledge already exists within us. Through the signs, symbols, and images in tarot, the seeker is directed to recollect the universal teaching that we are all the same in essence, each traveling the same road despite perceived differences in form. In this particular article, we find much more of a purpose for Freemasonry and the tarot to come together. And that is, of course, this idea of useful tools for reflection for those interested in doing the work. And that this last piece that talks about finding all the answers within yourself to know thyself is something to remember here as well. So. The Craftsman Plus question isn't going to be about these articles, but rather, it will be about the card that we pull momentarily. This new segment we'll call Reflection Point. Today's deck that we'll be using is the Smith Weight Tarot deck, known to some as the Rider Weight deck. Smith, of course, Pamela Coleman Smith, and Waite, as in Arthur Edward Waite. For those who don't know, I should also mention that when we do refer to the Ryder Waite deck, Ryder is the publishing company that later became Penguin. Just a fun fact for you. Now, I have our deck today, and I'm going to give it a quick shuffle. Now, at this point, Many tarot readers will cleanse the deck or they will ask a question before they draw the card. What we're going to do here is something totally different. We're not going to adhere to any kind of dogmatic practices with the tarot. Nope, not here. What I'm going to do is simply draw a card from somewhere in the deck and we're going to flip it over. And let's see what we get. Interesting. Well, the card that we drew is the number two. The High Priestess, key number two. The High Priestess sits on a throne. She is flanked on either side by the two pillars, one black, one white, Boaz and Jachin, the two pillars of Solomon's temple. Behind her, she has a drapery that gives us pomegranates and leaves and floral patterns. She holds a copy of the law or the Torah. She wears an equal cross on her chest 
that suggests equilibrium in spirit and material rather than some sort of religious context. At the base of her feet sits the crescent moon, and her dress pours like water. Now, keeping with the tradition of these particular cards, this is Arthur Edward Waite's deck. Now, in some tarot disciplines, cards can be drawn as face-up values and when they are reversed. So, let's say you pull a card of the High Priestess and when you pull the card, it's actually upside down. That means something different in the weight system. It also means something different in uh, many other tarot disciplines. However, I typically go by Paul Case's sentiments where we don't deal too much with the inverse version of cards. I find that sometimes those can be rather negative. And why focus on that? So in this case, our High Priestess description. So the veil that is behind the High Priestess is representative of a conscious and subconscious mind. Things you see, things you don't see. It also means that perhaps there are elements of your personal self, of your personal mind or the way you live, that are for your closest friends only, that you may be a guarded individual. The veil may represent the way you keep others out. The pomegranates really represent the same thing they do in Freemasonry, this idea of abundance. And in many cases, fertility, divine feminine nature. If we look at those pillars in a more objective way, this is the entrance to a divine or a sacred space. And again, it is between strength and establishment. So establishing something in strength. The colors, black and white, are representative of that duality. The masculine and the feminine. The dark and the light. And essentially the perfection you seek in order to pass through these elements of divine. To get to the sacred space, you have to master both a feminine and a masculine kind of doctrine. She wears blue and has a horned crown. And of course, again, that cross. All of this is a symbol of divine knowledge as a status in divine rulership. So perhaps this represents a call to recognize your divine feminine attribute. So what does it mean? Well, the card that comes directly before the High Priestess is the Magician and has its own meanings. That's key number one. What comes before that is key zero, which is the Fool. So the High Priestess has much to do with the subconscious mind, perhaps a higher self that you have. It also suggests some sort of spiritual enlightenment, some sort of intuition. It's calling attention to your intuition. It's calling you to be more in tune with who you are on that lower plane in the iceberg. So the lower half, the things you don't always see. Maybe those are your hidden biases. Maybe they're your hidden strengths. This is calling you to recognize those things. And the way to recognize this stuff is actually not to sit and fixate on these in a mindful, in a thinking and rational type of way, but rather it should come about in a way that is through trust of your intuition and realizing what comes from that and then learning from those. What I would say is that in this particular thing, for all of us, this reminds me to essentially look for areas in my life that might be out of balance due to the duality of the card, to trust my intuition, and that perhaps this may even be a call to connect with divine feminine energy, which would necessarily include your intuition, your compassion, empathy, all of these things. I think for today, when we think about this card, this high energy feminine card that deals with things like creativity and divine feminine energies, let's think about where can we focus in our lives that will aid in collaboration, that will aid in empathy, things that really are kind in nature. For our Craftsman Plus, tell me something related to what we would call sacred feminine energies that needs our attention right now. What do you think? Maybe you are firing at all cylinders and this doesn't apply to you. But I think for the most of us, we can definitely think of something where we can apply some more positive energy toward. For me, I likely need to rely on my intuition more, my compassion a little bit more. We can always have a little bit more of that. As we close out this week's segment on the tarot, I just would say, keep those things in mind. 
you know, there's a reason why tarot readings are quote unquote always right. And it's because they're for you to decipher for yourself. You make it right. Not me, not anybody else. So that's what we can contemplate this week. And we'll have a new card to draw and talk about next week. If you're at all interested in having like a full reading done or something like that at some point, feel free to email me and uh, we can work something out. You can reach me at admin at wcypodcast.com. Now that's it for this week. I want to thank all our producers, fellows, contributors, legacy partners for assisting us in bringing this program to the world, bringing Masonic education first and foremost, rising to the top. And for everybody out there who listens every week, who shares our videos, all of those things. And again, all of the links to everything we talked about this week will be in the show notes. I want to thank you all very much for joining us this week on the Whence Came You podcast. But that's it for this week. So until next week, stay on the level for Whence Came You. I'm Robert Johnson. Take care. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition. Music